Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to worship. Good morning. All right, great to see everyone. Uh, this is the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, if you're keeping track. <laughs> A warm welcome to all who are joining us, not only here in the sanctuary, but those of you that are joining us online. Happy to have you as well. If you're here in the sanctuary today, though, would you please take a moment and just look around and find the friendship pad, if you will, and make note of the fact that you're worshiping with us and pass that the length of your pew if there are others in your pew with you. Uh, hope that you'll join us after worship today for some uh, coffee and treats and fellowship upstairs in Davis Hall. Uh, if you're new to us and are wondering, okay, where's Davis Hall? Just go to your left as you exit the... Uh, sanctuary and then head straight upstairs and anyone would be happy to help you find that. Uh, during fellowship time today, uh, there will be a uh, bake sale benefiting uh, Bread for the World and I hope that you'll take advantage of that and, and give generously. Uh, speaking of giving, today is also Sensibility Sunday. Uh, for those of you that are unaware, the, all the change, it's loose change, all the change that we collect in containers right outside of the sanctuary doors uh, will be uh, to aid neighborhood families in need as well as our Presbyterian Hunger Program. Yeah, so I hope that you'll take advantage of those opportunities. Also want to bring to your attention something uh, in uh, both your bulletin and e-blast today. Um, there will be an informal time of remembrance for uh, Steve Mailing. Uh, many of you knew Steve as uh, one of our associate pastors here at Valley Church a number of years ago, and he's been retired now for some time, and went to be with the Lord uh, not, not too long ago. Uh, but there will be a, a gathering at First Presbyterian Portland, which was his, uh, he and Donna's church home. That'll be next Sunday, October the 23rd, in the Calvin Library, which is downstairs at First Press. Uh, that'll be a time for reflection and those that would like to remember with Thanksgiving uh, Steve's life. So please know that you're welcome to join in on, on that occasion. I uh, want to let you know that, uh, again, augmenting our uh, fall preaching series on the Apostles' Creed, we are meeting on Wednesdays. Any that are interested and able uh, for a class time to just expand our understanding of the Creed, uh, meet in the morning from 10.30 to 11.30 in Armitage, and then online in the evening from 7 to 8. And the links are available on the webpage or through the e-blast, either way. All right. Uh, next Sunday, um, we also will be having um, a 25th anniversary celebration for our Valley Christian Preschool housed right here in our church. And that, there'll be some celebrating during our worship time, but also afterwards during uh, our time of uh, reception following the service. And we'll be especially honoring, uh, many of you know Karen Broom, who has been teaching at the preschool from the very beginning. So that's an exciting thing. I hope that you'll join us for that celebration. And then finally, uh, as we look to the very end of the month, All Saints Day is October the 30th, but it's also our uh, dedication Sunday as we dedicate our uh, pledges, financial pledges for the coming year. But very importantly, we're celebrating uh, Valley's 80th birthday, our 80th anniversary of our chartering as a congregation, so I hope you'll join us on the 30th. Um, for All Saints Day, we'll be reading, of course, the, the names of uh, family and uh, friends as well as members of our congregation that have gone to be with the Lord uh, over the last year. So uh, if you would like uh, their names to be remembered uh, during that service, if you could get information to uh, the church office by next Sunday, that would be really helpful. Okay, lots of announcements. There are others that are there for you in your uh, worship folder, and I hope you'll read those. All right, but now let's prepare our hearts to worship God. stand and join me in the call to worship as found in your bulletins or on your screen. 
Come and worship Christ, the visible image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation, the eternal God, the one through whom all things were created and in whom all things are held together. This is our God. Let's worship together. be seated. Please join me in prayer as we invite God's presence into our hearts and minds together. Gracious God, we thankfully remember the life of our Lord Jesus Christ on this earth. Yet we also acknowledge our failure to respond faithfully to his witness. We confess that we have mistaken Jesus for a mere earthly king, friendly companion, or problem solver, failing to honor him as the ruler of all creation. We do not appreciate the depth of his passion and sacrifice on the cross, and we fail to acknowledge him as our savior. We have not walked faithfully in the way of Jesus Christ. Forgive us, we pray, and bring us ever more fully into the joy of knowing, loving, and serving Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, let us pray in silence, centering our whole being in God's presence. Lord. 
Please stand and hear the good news. Those who are in Christ are a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, with whom we have been reconciled through Christ. Friends, believe and now live the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and made new. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Please greet those around you with the peace of Christ or by commenting on the screen at this time. Let's be seated. We continue this morning with uh, the third of our stewardship moments, and I'm going to invite our illustrious youth minister, Jen Souders, to come join us, and she's got a word to share with us this morning. As I've been saying these weeks, uh, we don't give just to turn on the lights, but uh, to turn on the light of Christ in relationships, so share with us, Jen. Thank you. Yeah. So as Robin said, I am the youth minister here. And uh, throughout this month of October, as you know, we'll be talking about stewardship. Um, and the stewardship offerings of our church have been able to transform lives. And we saw that last week um, as we heard about ways that Valley has reached out through our online community to the wider community. Um, this week, I would like to talk about the different ways that stewardship can help uh, the youth uh, provide those different opportunities of mission throughout our own local community and global community. Uh, we have been able to do amazing things uh, for mission throughout our church. And this past summer, the youth, uh, as you know, went to Salie, Arizona through a serv Sierra Service Project um, to work with the Navajo Nation. And while we were there, we were able to help make homes more accessible for elders in the community. Um, in our case, we helped build a ramp and a um, porch for a, an elderly lady named Lula, who was really a lovely lady. Uh, this mission opportunity helped um, transform not only the lives of the youth that went on this trip, but also those that we helped work with. Um, one instance that I know really moved me and other youth was when Lula said, thank you so much for coming out here. Nobody comes out here to help us. And that really just broke my heart. It really opened our eyes too. So um, we, we saw the ways that um, our work has helped transform her life um, so that she can get in out of her house more easily. With uh, our stewardship offerings, we are able to do 
a lot more different mission projects, both locally and, like I said, uh, in the country and maybe even globally one day uh, with the youth. And um, we are hoping next uh, summer to go on another mission trip. So it is with your generous uh, giving that helps us go to these different places. And if you feel uh, so led to helping us, um, I ask that you prayerfully consider um, donating towards youth mission and uh, other options within the church. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jen. We appreciate that. We turn our attention now, friends, to the reading and hearing of God's word. And as we do so, I invite you to join me in prayer. Let's pray together. Well, gracious God, uh, by your Holy Spirit, we pray that you'd open our minds, that as the scriptures are read this morning and your word is proclaimed, that we may be led into your truth and taught your will, uh, all for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, we're continuing uh, this morning uh, with the fourth message of our fall preaching series, We Believe, exploring uh, the Apostles' Creed. For the past three weeks, uh, we have focused on the first section of uh, this Trinitarian Creed, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. But today we'll begin our consideration of the second and the longest section of the Apostles' Creed uh, with its singular focus on the person and work of Jesus. Roughly two-thirds, you can check me out on this, roughly two-thirds of this concise outline of the Christian faith focuses exclusively on Jesus, which makes sense given that the heart of our Christian faith is not a set of doctrines, but rather a person, Jesus. In the words of Australian theologian Ben Myers, uh, the real centerpiece of the Apostles' Creed is not a doctrine, but a name. At the center of the Christian faith is not an idea or a theory or even a vision of life, but the name of a person, Jesus Christ. Our faith centers on personal attachment to him. Well, both of our scripture passages for today will focus on the person and work of Jesus. These passages also, interestingly, uh, would have been considered hymns of our ancestors in faith. They are ancient hymns that were sung by our ancestors, uh, hymns that were sung in praise of Jesus. Uh, in those hymns, they declared, and we declare, that Jesus is the hope of the world and the Lord of all. So let's look to our first scripture passage, Colossians 1, 15 to 20, and listen together for God to speak. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he, may, he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What a heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving ceases. My comforter, my all in all, here in the power of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love. And righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied as every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live Deep in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stepped Bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my death. Destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man could ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the love of Christ, I'll stand. Here in the power of Christ. Thank you, Sienna. One morning, some years ago, there was a bookstore clerk by the name of Deborah who arrived to work early to open up her shop. Standing at the door waiting for the store to open was uh, a man dressed in the characteristic garments of a Hasidic Jew. As Deborah unlocked the door, the man quietly asked if he might come in. She hesitated. It was nearly an hour until the shop was supposed to be open, but he seemed polite and evidently was in need of something right away, so she decided to let him in early. After turning on the light, she said, would you like any help? Softly and with an accent, he said, yes, I want to know about Jesus. Well, this was not an altogether surprising request since the store specialized in books on religion. So Deborah guided the man uh, upstairs to the store's ample uh, section of books about Jesus. She pointed to the shelves filled with scholarly volumes of Jesus research and the books about the early history of the church. Uh, then she decided to go back downstairs, but the man called her back. 
No, he said, I, I want to know about Jesus, the Messiah. Don't show me any more books. You tell me what you believe. Was this man asking for interfaith dialogue? Um, for spiritual counsel? For evangelism? Deborah was unsure, but all she knew was that she was being asked what she had almost never been asked to do before, to put her faith into words. My Episcopal soul shivered, she said later, recalling the encounter. I gulped and told him everything I could think of, as much as I could sputter out in my confusion. You tell me what you believe about Jesus. Well, I don't know if that request makes your Presbyterian soul shiver, but um, our earliest ancestors in Christian faith would have had a response. Uh, in fact, they might have responded by breaking into song. Not just any song, mind you, but likely a song that contained the words of our second scripture reading for today. Philippians chap uh, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. So let's turn our attention to our second passage, and again, let's listen for God to speak. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, assuming human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him even more highly and gave him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name, at the name given to Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this too is the word of the Lord. Thank Thanks be to God. From the earliest years of the development of Christian faith, candidates for baptism were called upon to respond to their own version of, you tell me what you believe about Jesus. They would readily offer up the fruit of many, many months of study and prayer. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. That would have been their confession. So let's take a moment or a few moments to understand what these earliest Christians were affirming when they declared these particular words. Let's start at the beginning. I believe in Jesus. In the first instance, these early believers were confessing their conviction that Jesus was a first century Jewish man whose name literally means God saves. Jesus was a fully human man who was born to a peasant woman named Mary, lived in uh, Palestine during the reign of uh, Tiberius Caesar, was crucified on the order of a local, local governor by the name of Pontius Pilate, both the New Testament and also um, historical records written by the Roman historian Tacitus affirm these very basic facts about Jesus. The point, of course, is that Jesus was a real historical person, not an imaginary character, a real man who lived on planet Earth just like us. Theologian Alistair McGrath offers these thoughts about the historical reality of Jesus. The historical evidence for Jesus' existence is sufficient to satisfy all but those who are determined to believe he didn't exist, whatever the evidence may be. But of course, our earliest ancestors in faith uh, continued their confession by affirming, I believe in Jesus Christ. Now, technically, it would be more accurate to say, I believe in Jesus the Christ. For you see, Christ was not uh, Jesus' surname, uh, but rather it was his title, his title. Jesus' title, Christ or Christos in Greek, was derived from the Hebrew word for Messiah, which literally, as many of you know, means anointed one. 
uh, like the kings of the Old Testament who were, were anointed by God to rule over Israel. But of course we remember that uh, the king after king who ruled over Israel ultimately, well, they disappointed. The Old Testament uh, records God's promise that in the future a king, a Messiah, would come from the line of David who would not disappoint. A Messiah king whose kingdom, in fact, would never end. A Messiah king whose mission, according to the first chapter of Matthew, was to save his people from their sins. In confessing their faith in Jesus Christ, Christians through the centuries have affirmed that the true Messiah, uh, Israel's long-awaited deliverer, the promised one of the Old Testament, has in fact come. Well, as they stepped into the waters of baptism, early Christians also confessed their belief in as Jesus as God's only son. But what did they really mean when they said that Jesus was God's only son? Again, the Presbyterian study catechism from which I've been uh, quoting these last few weeks, and I commend to your attention because I think it really is a great document. It answers this question with these words. What do we mean when we say that Jesus is God's only son? That Jesus Christ is a unique person who was sent to do a unique work. The salient word, of course, is unique. Jesus is unique in that he shares a unique relationship with God the Father. Unique as in one of a kind. Uh, No one else shares this same relationship with God. Scripture declares uh, emphatically that you and I are daughters and sons, adopted daughters and sons of God. But only Jesus shares relationship with God as his only son. You see, affirming that Jesus is the son of God amounts to saying that Jesus is God. It's a statement of divinity. Again, the Presbyterian study catechism helps us understand the uniqueness of of Jesus' relationship with God the Father and the uniqueness of his mission with these words. No one else will ever be God incarnate. No one else will ever die for the sins of the world. Only Jesus Christ was such a person. Only he could do such a work. And in fact, he has done it. Well, Jesus, God's only son, his uniqueness was on full display in the incarnation, the incarnation. Jesus, as our Philippians hymn reminds us, uh, laid aside his privileges as God and took on human flesh to come amongst us. You may wonder, well, why? Why was that so necessary? The first chapter of John's gospel provides the answer with these words. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. The only Son of God, God incarnate, God in human flesh, came among us in Jesus because he wanted to make God, to make himself known to us. Some of you have read uh, the Mitford books in the series. There's one entitled At Home in Mitford, and you'll remember the main character is uh, Episcopal priest, Father Tim. Well, Father Tim one night comes into his uh, Episcopal sanctuary just after dark, and he doesn't expect to find anyone there, but he realizes that there is a man sitting uh, up front in one of the pews. He starts to offer uh, the man some help, but he notices that the man's head is bowed in prayer. His prayers gradually become more audible. And finally, he lifts his face toward the ceiling, and his voice rising to a shrill scream. If you're up there, prove it! Well, Father Tim slipped into the pew next to this stranger, and he said, I think the question isn't, are you up there? But rather, are you down here? Are you down here? You see, God's only son is the one who came down. God in Christ's love for humankind was so immense, he wanted to come down. Right where we live, 
And in fact, he did come down, Emmanuel, God with us, so that we might know him, so that he might bring us life in his name. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. The earliest Christian confession that we know of is Jesus is Lord. I mentioned in the first sermon of this series that in the second century, it was anything but safe, anything but tame to publicly declare oneself as a follower of Jesus Christ. In the Roman Empire, uh, refusing to bow down and confess Caesar is Lord was to risk execution. But some of our ancestors in faith went to their death rather than declare that anyone else other than Jesus was Lord. To understand the significance of the title Lord, we have to go again back to the Old Testament. I know I'm doing that a lot today. Where the word Lord is used again and again and again of God. The Old Testament writers used the word Lord as a stand-in for the Hebrew name of God, which was considered too holy to pronounce out loud. We know that to be Yahweh. When the Old Testament writers uh, translated from Hebrew to Greek, the language of the New Testament, the Greek word they used to translate God's most sacred name was Kyrios, which means Lord. It is the same title that was used by the New Testament writers to refer to Jesus. So when we confess that Jesus is Lord, we mean, just as our ancestors did, that Jesus has the same status as God himself. Now Paul, in our second scripture reading for today, uh, makes the very same point. Uh, He is echoing Isaiah chapter 45, when he says that God has exalted Jesus so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If we bend our knee to Jesus and confess him as Lord, as our ancestors did, it means in the words of the Heidelberg Catechism that we belong to him. We belong to Jesus in life and in death. He's our master, the undisputed authority of our lives. In the vernacular, he calls the shots. In his kingdom, he's the one that we follow, the one who's in charge of how we make decisions, important decisions, how we spend our money, how we raise our kids, how we treat family, friends, neighbors, and yes, enemies. So when we serve Jesus as Lord, that means our lives are his. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. That was the declaration of the earliest Christians, the earliest followers of the way, as they went down into the waters of baptism. And it's been the confession of countless women and men through the centuries. But I wonder this morning, I wonder, is this who Jesus is for you? As they made their way resolutely to Jerusalem and ultimately the cross of Calvary, Jesus asked his disciples, those who knew him best, a very provocative question. Who do you say that I am? It's still the question that Jesus poses to those of us that would follow him. And certainly it is the question that each of us must answer for ourselves. Several years ago, there was a fellow by the name of Martin Copenhaver, who's a minister of the United Church of Christ tradition. He was attending a pastor's conference in which there was a speaker, a British church historian uh, by the name of Michael Green. And he asked the pastors in attendance at this conference yet another provocative question. He said, when was the last time you told your congregation who Jesus is to you and what Jesus means to you? Copenhaver said he was haunted by the question for months. He said as a Christian preacher, he knew that he talked 
a good deal about Jesus. We preachers do a lot of talking. But not necessarily about who Jesus was to him and what Jesus meant to him personally. So some months later, uh, when Copenhaver was concluding his time at First Congregational Church in Burlington, Vermont, and moving on to another um, pastorate, he decided, all these months he'd been haunted by this question, he decided he wanted to address the question posed by uh, church historian Michael Green. He would do so in his final sermon to this congregation, and he entitled the sermon, What It's All About. And this is what he said, a quote from his sermon. As I'm about to leave, there's something I want to tell you. I want to tell you what Jesus means to me. I want to share my belief that everything depends on him. I want to urge you to learn from him. I want to assure you that you can lean on him in times of trouble. I want to ask you to listen to his words of challenge. I want to tell you that I believe that you can entrust your life to him. I want to affirm that he is Lord of this church and that in his name you are freed to love one another and empowered to share that love with a hurting world. I want to profess that though once people could not look at the face of God and live, now we are invited to look at the face of God in him, in Jesus and live as we have never lived before. He is Emmanuel, God with us, God with us all. Whether we are together or apart, that's what it's all about. That's all I know. That was the end of his sermon. At the conclusion of the service, uh, Copenhaver did what he did every week. He went to the back of the sanctuary, to the door, to greet people for one last time as their pastor. One woman who is a beloved uh, saint of the church um, came to the head of, head of the line to greet him and was so overcome with emotion that uh, she uh, went away and, and had to go to the back of the line to compose herself. And uh, Copenhaver assumed that uh, the prospect of saying goodbye to him was just too much for her. Um, but she finally reached Copenhaver once again extended her hand to shake his hand, and uh, he describes that her shockingly blue eyes were magnified with tears. Her voice cracked as she looked at him and said, why didn't you tell us this before? Can I just say that I hope uh, to never have that question directed to me? Um, I, I don't know how Copenhaver dealt with that. He doesn't say, but um, actually the last part of this chapter in a book I was reading, he says, and that was the question that haunted me next. So, who do you say that Jesus is to you? I can't answer that question for you. Uh, it's one that we all must answer for ourselves. But I can tell you who Jesus is to me. I think that's fair enough. I am your pastor. Uh, with those who've come before me, I affirm with all my heart that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God, and he is indeed my Savior and Lord. And I can tell you that by God's grace, in Jesus, I have discovered what the scriptures refer to as life that really is life. Jesus called it life in all of its fullness, and he promised that to those of us who attach ourselves to Jesus. Um, it would not take you long to understand that I am far from a perfect disciple of Jesus Christ. Far from it. But I love him. I follow him. Uh, I belong to him. I serve in his name. Um, Sienna sang it well. He is my all in all. And I gratefully bow before him and profess that he is my Lord and he is Lord of all. And one day, as the scriptures promise, I hope that every voice will join in singing to him. Why? Because they have found life that really is life, and it's worth singing about. 
May it be so that all honor and glory may be given to the one who has been revealed to us as maker, most blessed redeemer, and friend. Amen? May it be so. Please join me in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As people of faith, let us now pray together. Loving and gracious Lord, we come to you with deep, silent sighs. Our hearts overflow with gratitude for the boundless blessings we enjoy. This beautiful fall weather is extending our local harvests and allowing us to enjoy the great Northwest outdoors. Valley Preschool is filled with the laughter of young children and the church's calendar lists activities for all generations. We thank you for all of the vendors and volunteers who yesterday greeted hundreds of neighbors and people from throughout the area committed to recycling 
and working to save this Earth's precious resources. Thank you for your many blessings and ongoing presence, Lord. God, we also come to you with hearts burdened by the wave upon wave of destruction in our world. The quickening climate crisis is touching all areas on this planet. We pray for those whose lives have been ravaged by Hurricane Ian, including families in Cuba, Florida, and South Carolina. May life's basic necessities like food, clean water, health care, and shelter return as quickly as possible. We pray for the hundreds of millions of people struggling with dire humanitarian crises in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Haiti, Myanmar, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, Yemen, and so many more countries. May people around the world respond to our brothers and sisters' ongoing needs. We pray for the rights and safety of Iranian girls and women. May they be freed from the violence and tyranny they are enduring. We pray for peace in Ukraine and for the world to help support these courageous people in their struggles to save and rebuild their country. Here in our own country, we continue to face the heartbreak of senseless mass shootings, increasing homelessness, and food and health care insecurity. Please be with leaders at all levels to work together to address these and other pressing issues. Focus on protecting the health and safety of all people, plants, and animals. Within our Valley family and extended community, Lord, we lift up those needing your healing grace. May all be comforted by your abundant love, and may you continue to lead us here at Valley to provide aid, along with our sustaining prayers. Our hearts are open to you, Lord. Guide us to do your work here on earth. We pray this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Loving God, how we thank you that all gifts come from your hand, and we, Lord, are your grateful people. We pray that you would add your richest blessing upon these gifts that have been given. May they indeed extend your kingdom in this place and literally around the world. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Friends, there's something really beautiful about imagining ourselves joining our voices in the everlasting song with those that have come before us, those that are with us now, and those that will come after us. It is an everlasting song in praise of Jesus. So go now in peace, love and serve our Lord, and may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and remain upon you this day and forevermore. Let God's people together say, Thank you.